Hey everyone, let's talk graphic narratives. In today's lecture, I'm going to talk about a very important man who, for all intents and purposes, was able to create the thing which we now call comics. Picture stories have been around for a long time, and they had primarily utilized what we call the serial narrative, where pictures were laid out in a row. But with Rudolf Topfer, we have this new kind of picture story where several pictures on the page combine together in novel ways to add an extra dimension to the nature of the picture story. And this extra dimension has no better word than montage. Now, Rudolf Topfer was a teaching director of a boys' preparatory school, which he founded in 1822 in Geneva, Switzerland. And from there, he was publishing some short stories and eventually became the chair of rhetoric and literature at the Academy of Geneva. He was a well-respected scholar and a literary man of sort of romantic, sentimental, popular literature. He was relatively conservative, and his social commentary always makes fun of people who take themselves too seriously. His father was a well-known landscape artist, and early in life, Rudolf Topfer had the ambition to become a painter himself, except for that his eyes really weren't strong enough to do the kind of detailed work which was all the popular rage at this time. And so he set himself up, as previously noted, as a novelist, and there began to really explore his creative talents. But as a teacher, he was keenly interested in new and novel ways to bring his students' interest in literature. And one of his experiments, which proved immensely popular, were these funny little picture stories that he created for them to read. He called them Histoire en image, and he would set up several panels on a page, and in each one there would be a little bit of action and a little bit of text. In this way, he could get his students to follow along in the sort of funny, eccentric stories that he told through pictures and words. Here we see one of his early experiments called Histoire de M Monsieur Vibois, and 1827. Now, these picture stories were circulated among his friends, and one of them had a close connection to a very famous man of letters named Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Now, Goethe was a very serious classical scholar who had written many uh, a novel and critical treatise about the state of art and literature. And in his old age, he was shown these picture stories, and he found them really quite fantastic, and he encouraged Rudolf Topfer to have them published. He felt that this was a new kind of literature, a new kind of storytelling that had great potential. So if we look at Topfer's creation and we compare it to the one that he said inspired him most, William Hogarth, from about a hundred years earlier, we can see that Topfer is trying to do something really quite original. Whereas Hogarth was trying to capture a moment in time that ideally could be dwelled upon and evocative of the story event. And we could see in this sort of crystalline detail every aspect of that moment. And so we could study it and slowly pick out the clues that were hidden inside this very fine engraving. Rudolf Topfer, on comparison, really wanted to keep his drawings sketchier. He wanted them to be read faster. He didn't want people to labor over any individual picture. He wanted to see them in more quick succession. And he said it's more like a theater play in the way that we experience it as one moment leading to a next. And so his drawings are looser, 
and he uses more text in relationship to the picture. Now, Rudolf Topfer's stories are really quite fantastic. They are adventures, they're romance, they're fantasy, they're satires, they're farces, and the sort of mixed genre that he creates plays off this sort of way in which pictures and words combine together to create this, what we call today, an unreliable narrator. Meaning, who are we really to believe here? What we read or what we see? And this is a really interesting dynamic that he played with consistently throughout all his stories that he created. So here we see Monsieur Jabot. He can sleep with one eye only. Mr. Jabot dreams of mazurka music. Mr. Jabot dreams of intoxicating things. Mr. Jabot dreams of great deeds in the presence of an adorable woman. And so all of these actions are drunk together in a night of dreaming, and each one of them is more absurd than the next. And yet together they create this impression of a moment in, and tell us something about Jabot. And, and that is what makes his storytelling so extraordinary. Notice the shifts in size of the panels, the arrangement of the text, all these different changes that he's doing to the page to create this overall impression of a picture story. So Topfer was most likely inspired by another literary genius from 50 years earlier, is Lawrence Stern, Life and Opinions of Tristram Shandy Gentleman, which was enormously popular and translated into many languages all across Europe. Lawrence Stern saw his novel in this fits and starts and backward loops and employed a number of sort of visual tricks to engage his readers and make them really aware of the fact that they were reading a novel, not to get immersed in the, the illusion of the story. And the same is true with Topfer. He's always sort of jumping from one bit to another, uh, focusing on one extraordinary event, leaps in time and place that happen in an instant or over a long period of time, all appear across the page in ways that make people feel like they are experiencing a crazy journey. Topfer did a lot of things that were really very innovative in his time with his, his picture stories. And so in his time-based humor, one of his uh, tricks was to sort of take a scene and then splice it narrower and narrower and narrower and narrower, advocating for the kind of return uh, to absurdity where an action, here we see our hero is getting a job in, in selling encyclopedias door to door. And here he is moving from one place to another, to another, to another. And the sense of repetition adds to the absurdity of this. And he, he found this really quite funny. He loved this way. He could sort of splice a scene down almost to nothing. And he called this his hyperball. Now, what's really interesting about this really novel way of showing picture stories is that many people would eventually imitate Rudolf Topfer. But this particular trick of Topfer's was never picked up or carried on into the future by any other artist. As I mentioned before, Hogarth is all about capturing a moment in time, whereas Topfer is trying to create a sense of motion across time, actions. He's using zip lines. He's using a sense of speed and action. Notice how these three panels get shorter and shorter as the action is speeding up. And so there's a really fascinating way in which time and the size of the panels seem to create certain impressions upon our mind as we're reading. Topfer also destroys his narrative, the linearity of the narrative, by repeating certain actions over and over again, as if the story returns back to its origins uh, without ever really proceeding in any linear way. And so he takes this idea of the sequence and the picture, and he conflates this in a way that we are always aware of the absurdity of what we are seeing. 
Now, a word about this idea of montage. The word montage has many different definitions depending on the medium in which it is employed. In a graphic narrative, when we talk about a montage, we're talking about a sequence of pictures that, when combined together, convey an original idea. Uh, that is not contained in any one of the individual panels. The sort of collective impression, and this collective impression has to do with the way in which those panels are arranged so that we see them, the size, the arrangement, the composition, all these different visual clues lead us into having an impression. So here we see Monsieur Pencil, who is an artist, draws from beauteous nature. Monsieur Pessot, who is an artist, views his achievement with complacence and notes that he is content with it. Monsieur Pencil, who is an artist, notes that he is convenient. He is content with it upside down as well, and even looking at it over his shoulder. Now, this repetition adds to the absurdity of it. If it had just been a single panel, as you might have seen in Hogarth, he might have gotten a kind of mild taste of sarcasm or humor, but the repetition just keeps building and adding to the ridiculousness of this character and his fascination with his own work. Now, one of the great mysteries about Tompfer and what sort of keeps him from being coming sort of the great innovator of comics as we know them today is that even though he seems to have been aware of speech bubbles, as you see here on the left, in his picture stories, he never employed them. Speech bubble at this time was sort of falling out of favor. As I mentioned earlier, George Cruikshank, the illustrator in England, kind of took speech bubbles out of his pictures and preferred to put his text below. And Topfer, in that same vein, also does the same thing. And it may have been this idea that he was really trying to initially teach reading, and he wanted this sort of educational uh, function of a text to be there as a text, separate from the speech bubble, which was always considered a bit of a, a cheat, or at best, a kind of fakery in the attempt to create a representation of speech with words. Now, Topfer was a really brilliant man, and he not only invented this new way of making picture stories, his histoire in image, he also wrote about them, and he, he thought very carefully about the elements within them and how they worked. In his essay on physiognomy in 1845, he really looked at caricature and he talked sort of briefly about what goes into making a picture story. In that, he talks about a picture story being a kind of theater play and that you have to sort of think about it in terms of that sort of drama and pacing and action that would go into a play. Furthermore, in his study, he makes some really interesting observations about the nature of caricature. He says, if we look at a doodle, any kind of doodle, no matter how simple it would be, we will notice that it has some kind of expressive face. And we can combine the elements of that face in many different novel ways. But he notices certain kinds of patterns. He said, for instance, that if the forehead is bulging, that is not really a sign of intelligence. But if the jaw is drooping or sagging or weak looking, then that is the appearance of someone who is a little bit dim-winded. Whereas someone with a strong jaw, no matter how sloping, or oddly shaped their nose and forehead might be, then they appeared intelligent. And so he, he saw this as a really curious thing. Why is it, through our perception of the jawline, we read somebody's, a character's intelligence? And he made a very interesting conclusion from this observation. 
that the caricature is not an apt description of the subject of its parody. It is, in fact, merely a reflection of the biases inherent in the viewer. Now, one of the things that allowed Rudolf Topfer to create his works in this light, sketchy manner was that his drawings were his own, that he was able to reproduce these through this new technology, wherein he would draw directly on a specially treated piece of paper, and then that paper could be transferred to this stone. The stone would be treated in such a way that ink would adhere to wherever he had put his lines and be resisted everywhere else. And then this stone was used to print the pages. This is called lithographies. It was invented by Alois Sonnefelder about 70 years earlier, but the technique had now really started to get a foothold. And it allowed for a more expressive line, a more spontaneous line, because the artist was no longer making a work of art and then applying that work to a, a technology such as engraving or woodcut, which would often require a separate or different artist to translate the drawing into printable material. And so the artist had this much more immediate effect on the image that he was creating. And you can see that if we compare an engraving by Hogarth to a lithographic print by Daumier, we can see the lithographic print is much more expressive. The line quality really feels like you're looking at somebody's drawing. And this is a way in which lithography had this new expressive power. And we'll talk how that played out later. Now, Topfer had a great deal of impact. His works were translated into many different languages, mostly pirated, so which he didn't get any money from that. But in France, uh, where his work was especially popular, he had a very wide-ranging impact. And many artists, Lyon Spiti, Gustave Doré, many more, much more skilled artists even, took a hand at making his picture stories. And it was even brought over to the United States, translated into English and given a completely different name and billing, The Adventures of Obadiah Old Buck. And so this was printed in the United States in 1842 and was printed there for many decades as a very popular pastime. So it's unmistakable that the invention that Topfer came up with for his school children was indeed the very source and inspiration for everything that we begin to call comics today. <laughs> 